Welcome back to Combo Class. As you can tell, I have a lot of clocks around here. But what do these clocks have to do with these three items on my desk? A calendar, a ruler, and a carton of eggs. They actually have something really particular in common. It's the number 12, or a dozen as we nicknamed it. There's not that many numbers we nicknamed, so if we nicknamed it a dozen, it's probably pretty important. We decided to cut a year into 12 months. Some places decided to cut a foot into 12 inches, which even though the metric system is a lot more logical, there is some reasoning behind the 12 inch to foot thing. And we decided that 12 eggs fit well in our Oh, damn my eggs. This one's still good, maybe. Okay. I think this one's still good. That's probably good. Um, okay. But I'm just trying to get the eggs back in. Get, put them back in and we'll try it okay, again. Good. That was a pretty good take. I think do you think we can, think be, we can redo the take? Might be do you think to. it's gonna break continuity? I don't think so. Now 12 isn't the only number that's really useful in terms of how divisible it is for its size. And even on this clock, we have another one of those numbers hidden right in front of our faces. So 12 was what the hour hand was counting, but the minute and second hands are counting these 60 littler ones, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. And they chose 60 on purpose because it's so divisible. And we actually use that in our day-to-day -day life. Like when we say, it's a half past something. That means, oh, because 60 could be divided in half, we can use half past to mean 30. We can say quarter past noon to mean 1215. And if we were smarter, we would be taking more advantage of this divisibility and saying things like a fifth past noon to mean 1212, which I think I'll start using that more. Now, apart from 12 and 60, are there any other numbers that are super divisible for their size? Well, it turns out there are, and there is a mathematical definition that they came up with to figure out which numbers we can call the most divisible for their size. Almost like anti-primes, which is a nickname of them, because they're numbers that, unlike primes, which can't be divided, can be divided in more ways than any number leading up to them. There are terms like abundant numbers and colossally abundant numbers, but I'm gonna go with my favorite, the simplest and most standard definition of what a number that has the most factors for its size means, and that's something called a highly composite number. Now, you might remember that a composite number in general is kind of like the opposite of a prime. It's a number like 14, for example, that can be broken down into two times seven, unlike a prime like 13 that can only be broken down into one or itself. But a highly composite number like we've been hinting at is one that can be broken down in more ways than any other number leading up to it. Now let's start at the beginning and see how this works. We got the number one, which is special. Neither a composite nor a prime because it only has one factor. It's the only number like that. But it is a highly composite number, despite not being composite, because being the only one in the race so far with one factor, it wins the race. Now we get two, which is a prime. Again, not a composite number, but it is a highly composite number, ironically, because being able to break it into one times two gives it two factors, and it, it now won the race. But three, which can be broken down into one times three, has the same amount of factors as something that we've already done, so it doesn't set any new records. Let's try out four. Four, we can do one times four, but we could also do two times itself. Four now has three factors and has won the race, meaning it also is a highly composite number. Five, like three, is gonna be prime and only can be broken down into one in itself, so it doesn't set anything special. Six, though, we get a new record with one times six or two times three, adding up to four factors. So six is our next highly composite number. And spoiler alert, seven, eight, nine aren't gonna do anything special, set any new records. Even 10, which we count in base 10, 
doesn't set anything specialer than six. It also has four factors. The next one to break the record will be 12. So here's the first 21 highly composite numbers. Now these highly composite numbers, like we said, are defined by having more factors than any number smaller than them. But some mathematicians wanted to make the rules a little stricter to have a tighter list with less numbers. So there is a stricter definition of most factors for its size called superior highly composite numbers. And the definition for that's a little technical. So I'll just flash it on the screen here and put some little stars next to the ones that mathematicians call superior highly composite numbers. So we've already seen that 12 was on a ton of stuff. And we know if we double that, we get the total amount of hours in a day, 24, which we talk about a lot. 60 was in all kinds of stuff. But which of these other numbers pop up in other aspects of our life? Well, how about 360? That's how many degrees are in a circle, mathematicians decided. 180 right there is how many degrees are in like one side of a line. We divide that into a 90 degree angle if we want to write triangle. So a lot of these show up in degrees. 720 shows up in degrees and in video resolution. If you've ever seen 720p videos before 1080 was a big one. I guess I better sneak a 1080 into here because even though it didn't fully make it with the highly composite rules, it didn't make a new record for having more factors than 840, a clone of it will show up on the list later. Oh, actually a clone of it already showed up, look. And this number 5040 here has a fun historical context. The old school philosopher Plato thought that this exact number, 5040, would be the perfect amount of people to put in small like city-state regions because this number can be divided in so many different ways. So if you needed to make different sectors of it to divide up votes or divide up resources or anything, you could divide it into 10 zones, 5 zones, 12 zones, 6 zones, all kinds of ways. And because of that, he loved this number. And I think he might have also liked the fact that it's what we call seven factorial, which means it's one times two times three times four times five times six times seven. And if you've ever seen an exclamation mark after a number like that, it's what mathematicians call factorial, meaning multiplying all of the integers leading up to that number. And in fact, not only is 5040 equal to seven factorial, but some of these earlier ones are factorials too. One is one factorial, obviously. Two is two factorial, semi-obviously. And let's see, six is three factorial. Let's see where four factorial's at. Oh, it's 24. How about five factorial? Oh, it's 120. So all these factorial, wait, wait where's six? Six factorial's hiding over here. So all the factorials up through seven happen to be on this highly composite number list, but eight factorial isn't. It turns out eight factorial does not break any records in terms of having more factors than any smaller numbers. So that's the last factorial I think that will ever end up on this highly composite number list. All right, now let's see some ways in which having a highly composite number might be practical in your life. Let's say you pack boxes and you ship some sort of product. Well, first, if you want to fill a room with your boxes, if your room happened to be like two by six or three by four, we would end up with exactly 12 boxes we could fit in there. And maybe if you got the third dimension involved and you had a small truck that could fit two sideways and two sideways and three long, well, we would end up with 12 boxes that would fit in that too. And maybe it's a little bigger, maybe you have like two by three by four, let's say. Well, that turns out to contain 24 boxes. And maybe each box contains a carton of 12 eggs. And maybe you have some amount of trucks and maybe you deliver once a day per week. Well, the amount of boxes you're gonna end up delivering that week is highly likely to be one of these numbers. There have been times in history where when describing goods and shipping stuff, 120 was called a long hundred. And I like that. I think we should bring it back. And they also sometimes went with 
1200 as the long thousand, because you'd assume why not just tack a zero on the end of the 120, base 10, you know? But really, a long thousand should have been this fellow. Super divisible. If you were ordering a certain amount of grains of rice and you wanted to divide it up and didn't know how many guests you were gonna have, and you wanted them all to have the same number of grains of rice, and you wanted about a thousand, this would be a great number to buy. So what about the long million, if we were to go all the way up there? Well, I'm not gonna write all of the highly composite numbers between here and a million, that would take a while, so I'll put a little ellipsis and skip to the one that's right before a million. So here we get to the ones that are around a million. The one that's right under a million is this weird clone of 720. 720,720. I like that guy. Since there's long thousands and stuff, let's call this guy a short million. And then we can call this guy a short thousand, which is, you know, a good use for it because that shows up in video resolutions, shows up in angles. And I guess since this guy might as well get a nickname, we'll call him the Thin Thousand. Now, how about this? This one's kind of actually more like a weird clone of what's called a gross. 12 times 12. They use this number 144, which is 12 12s back in the day and still currently sometimes to measure stuff because like we've seen, 12s are practical. And even though a normal gross, as they call that amount, didn't make it on our list, this weird clone of it did. And so this monstrous guy, I think we should call our long million. And this guy I was saving for last because that one's really the most practical. It's closest to what we already think of as a million. Close enough that you would have no idea if you saw a million grains of rice or this amount of grains of rice. It's about 8% more than a million. And since it can be so divisible, this is going to be called our practical million. I didn't write down the names for the other guys, try and remember those long ones and stuff, but I'm writing this because I really think that this should be our practical million. And we're going to let this guy be our practical thousand, even though he wasn't highly composite. Now, looking down this list, we see all these cool, weird clones. We get these 216, 2160, 280, that it. 360, 360 with an extra O. Uh, for some reason, this guy is also superior. That's 720, 720 again with another O. Another clone of this guy. What, what the heck is going on here? So I don't even know. If you want to track your way down these highly composite numbers, you see some pretty monstrous, fun clones. But I think my main agenda with this episode, apart from showing you guys some fun facts, is to start this thing being called a long hundred again, this thing being called a long thousand again, this being our new practical million, and this being our practical thousand. So now that we've sunk our teeth into these numbers, numbers that get a special name, highly composite numbers, because they can be divided so many ways. And in fact, they also get the nickname anti-prime because of how many ways they can be divided. Maybe next class, we should flip to the opposite of that and look at anti-anti-primes, by which I mean primes. Uh, good old prime numbers that their only factors are themselves or one. Until then, I hope you have an excellent, highly composite day. Oh.